All right. Okay, so I graded your um, research mini projects. So, and I also assign collaboration points as instructed by you. If you did not get an email confirming that I assigned your collaboration points, then I didn't. So, Um, don't forget to do that if you collaborated with someone. Um, also, you know, I think that the, the presentations are pretty good. So I'm going to change my approach from um, asking you to send me an email if I can upload it to, uh, to Blackboard to sending me an email if you don't want me to upload it. But your all of them are pretty good. And I think uh, we could benefit from watching you know, the other the other topics, the, the ones that I guess that each one of you didn't work on. So I think we'll do that. Over that can some soda here. Um, okay, anything else? Questions or no? Okay. So last time we were looking at this problem. We we'll only sketch the solution so we have more time. Today. So this is uh, an alternative scenario for a supernova 1A explosion. So you have two point bars, and each one of them has uh, the same mass, so n. And so the center of mass is going to be in the middle, you know, orbiting each other. They are gravitationally bound, and they might be losing energy, kinetic energy, in the form of gravitational waves. So what will happen as the energy decreases, what happens to the separation between them? Lowers and eventually you don't end up gliding, right? Could you repeat that? George? Yes. Could you repeat that? They'll eventually end up colliding as the distance shortens, right? So the distance is going to shorten as the kinetic energy disperses through uh, gravitational waves. I think so. So let's check it out. So they're separated by a distance uh, r as always, and they have a angular frequency omega. So the kinetic energy is two, because we have two stars, one half and B squared. So this is M omega. Can get rid of the twos. B squared R over two. 
square with the distance from the center of mass, the axis of rotation. So we uh, Kepler's law. This one. Uh, this would be equal to so the total mass is twice two m and g over r cube. So then the kinetic energy. If you just put this one in here. Will be two m squared over g divided by a q. Then we're going to have the r squared over four. So we get rid of this one. So we use a two. So we can get rid of this one. This one becomes an, becomes an r. So it's uh, m squared g over 2r. What is the, the potential energy, gravitational potential energy? It's g m m over R. So the total kinetic, the total energy is going to be G M squared over R. One half minus one. So it's going to be minus two uh, because minus one half. Total energy. Will we have predicted that? Yes or no? Yeah. How? Um, just for like um, from the real term. That's right. So, this is a question that I'm going to, so let's keep this one in mind. I need some more space here. This equation Is Weinberg two point three point seven? Did you think you could raise your camera like like a little bit, a little bit? Please. Sorry about that. That was a little much. You didn't realize. You should let me use. No, you're back to normal. <laughs> Is 
really humongous porridge book. I mean, we're just missing the first line. Right now, it's fine. I'm sorry, I can't, I can't really see the, any of the exponents. Yes, yeah, so maybe you can change the angle a bit more so that you don't see the, the light in there. Thank you. So, how's that? Pretty good? I see it completely. Everyone else? Awesome. So, looks pretty complicated. Um, what is it? It's um, some average power. So, it is the rate at which energy is lost uh, through gravitational radiation, gravitational waves. So, if you want to derive it, you have to go into general relativity. But once you take it out of general relativity, you can uh, use it with your regular physics, classical physics, so non-GR. Um, so this FV over here, it's a, a function that accounts for uh, the eccentricity of the orbit. So it's like, a, a, well, it's, it's a sum, but you end up with a number uh, that's, that's multiplying the rest. But if the eccentricity is zero, then is equal to one. So we can, we can forget about it. Uh, so here, mu is the reduced mass. So m1, m2 over one plus m2. And the two masses are the same in this case. So this is just m squared over 2m. You can get rid of this one and this one. So it's just m over 2. So then if you want to make it squared, this is m squared over 2 squared. So you can put it in there. So I'm going to rewrite this equation a little bit. So uh, first we can take all of these things out. So we get this, this one is two to the fifth. I think we prefer. Yes. So we have a G. Um, m squared. This total mass is 2m. So that's q. Then we have the g cubed our fourth All right, so this becomes big. We can move this one.
we can move everything. Well, not everything. Almost everything. Um, which is something that is to the fifth. So two G small m over c squared r. Then outside we have two c to the fifth over five g. So the cool thing about this um, form of writing it is that this factor um, is unitless. Okay, so I'm going to write it in this form. It's a little bit easier to deal with. So let's move it up here. So we also know from the previous part that the total energy is negative gm squared over r. So we can take the we take the time derivative. This one, then this should be equal to this. Okay, so now we have a differential equation. Get rid of these negatives. Um, so we can get what is the only thing that is changing here? It's a function of time. The radius. Everything else is a constant, right? Mass remains constant. G and C are. Constants of the universe. Okay, so oh, I was missing a two over here. Sorry. So this is going to be. G n small n over two So I'm going to take the r to the fifth over here outside. So now we have these. And we let u be 1 over r just to make things a little we're clear. And this is just u, and this is u to the fifth. So 
we can move the U to this side. And so we will have the U U to the fifth equals uh, two over G M squared. This part will be right here. You can put the DT over here. This one. Then we can integrate on both sides. This whole thing is a constant. So this is going to be just T. So that's the constant. And over here, we're going to have. Can you still see this slope? This is minus one over four u to the four. And u is just one over r. So we can move this four over here, this becomes an eight. And then this is just. Um, R to the four. So now we have the actually just make it pretty. We can use the negative on this side. Can you see it? Yes, right? Yes. So we have the radius. As a function of the time, uh, plus some constant. So let's say that let's see, I'm gonna let's get one. A bit further away, where we have more space. And So what is R at time zero? Well, if R, if T is zero, then this whole term is zero, and we only have the C. So C is equal to the initial separation between them. So we can rewrite it as that. If it takes um, What is the initial separation if the initial masses are one solar mass and it takes them 
10 giga years to, uh, to collect. Well, we know everything in there. I'm not going to clutter the, uh, the whiteboard too much. But what is R going to be over here in the site? Would you let it go to zero or like to the radius of the star? Mm, no, to zero. I mean, really, you're, you're right. It should be the, the radius of the, of the two stars, right? But since R is much larger than the radius, we can just say zero. Okay. It might have much of an effect. So then this whole thing is zero. Right. So we can move this one to the other side as positive. And so we get the the initial separation. So if you plug everything in there, you get Um, R zero equals 2.4 times 10 to the nine years. So one astronomical unit is um, 1.5 times 10 to the 11 meters. So this initial radius, 0 0.016 astronomical units. So um, yeah, this is probably, um, I have it right down here. So this is about six times the distance from from the Earth to the Moon. So you know, not not that small, but definitely not big. So, what do you think of uh, uh, gravitational waves as a way to use energy? Is it, uh, is it fast? It looks pretty slow for me. It is two thirds pH. Um, of the universe, right? And they were kind of close to each other. So it is pretty slow, but it does depend, it depends on mass. So what will happen um, if you increase the mass, I don't know, like an order of magnitude? What do you expect will happen to the time to collide? Should be like a thousand times faster though? Yep, something like that. Uh, we have the uh, M2 over here and M to the peak over here, right? So if you increase the, uh, 
the mass by a little bit, the time decreases considerably. So if you had more massive objects, let's say, um, you know, like neutron stars or, or black holes, then the time will actually be, be pretty fast. So there will be radiating power pretty quickly. So is the Earth-Moon system uh, producing gravitational radiation? Aren't they like slowing each other's momentum instead, like angular momentum down instead of producing gravitational waves? Yeah. Like if you went to or, the crux of what I wanted to, to ask. So this predicts that if you have two bodies orbiting each other, then the radius has to decrease because they lose energy to, uh, to uh, gravitational waves. So what's going on with the Earth-Moon system? I mean, isn't the moon distancing itself every, every year? Yep, which is the opposite of what this is telling you. So where's the, where's the disconnect? Is it because of the gravitational radiation of the sun? Mm. Like it affecting our system? I don't think so. I don't, you know, in, in what way do you think it will affect our system? Because for the most part, you know, our, our planet, I guess the whole universe is kind of transparent to, uh, to gravitational waves. Wouldn't it be the way that the moon was formed from like a meteor striking Earth and a piece of Earth coming off of it? Having that left remnant um, velocity going outwards? So it is true that uh, because the, it was a, a big impact, you know, uh, a lot of energy was injected into the system. Uh, that's why the orbit of the moon is elliptical. Right? So it's managing that extra energy. Um, as things lose energy, you know, they move to the bottom of that potential that I drew last time. So the orbits become uh, uh, circles, circular. So it is true that there's an extra, there's extra energy in there, extra kinetic energy. So these equations do not hold that well, but I think there's something else. So that the uh, uh, Earth is rotating, but uh, the Moon's tail is locked. Yeah, it, it, it's 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 in that direction. So this is assuming that the bodies, you know, the two stars, uh, are either like not rotating, like uh, they're rotating about each other, but they're not rotating themselves. Um, or that they are not losing, you know, somehow they're not losing that rotational energy. But uh, yes, so the, the Earth-Moon system, uh, the Moon is already tidally locked. The, the Earth is not. If you decrease the radius a lot, you know, the two bodies definitely are going to be tidally locked and in a circular orbit. Um, so, 
the Earth is becoming tidally locked with the Moon, though. Uh, how is that happening? Is it by like tidal effects? Yes. So the the moon is creating this friction, right? Um, friction with the ocean, friction with the mantle, you know, all, all parts of the of the Earth. So uh, that friction creates heat, and the heat is radiated out you know, as infrared light. So the the Earth Moon system is transforming uh, the rotational energy of the Earth into thermal energy that can then leave. And when it leaves, the angular momentum has to be conserved. And so, in order to conserve the angular momentum, the Moon has to move further away. So this will not apply to the Earth Moon system until they are you know, like tidally locked, um, always face, facing each other. And you know, at that point, the, the tidal effects are, you know, are minimal. And so you, the Earth is not going to lose uh, more rotational energy that way. And then is when you start applying um, you know, this, you can apply this framework. So the Earth Moon system is never going to be tidally locked because the time that it will require for the system to get there is longer than the lifetime of the, of the sun because the rest of the life that the, time, that the sun has. So this will never apply. But it does apply to you know, these white dwarfs, neutron stars for sure, black holes for sure. So these systems do lose uh, rotational energy through gravitational waves. Okay, so let's put this in the, the back burner for a little bit. Okay, what is that? You recognize them? How do we call those equations? It's Maxwell's, right? These are the Maxwell equations. Um, what do we use them for? Magnetism. Huh? Uh, what is E? What is B? Okay. 
You guys don't know this stuff? It's okay if you don't. I just want to know. Not off the top of my head, so yeah. Okay. Okay, sounds good. Isn't this the magnetic field? Yes, yeah, so this is magnetic field, and this is the electric field. Um, where right here, rho is the charge. Um, this is the time derivative of the magnetic field. So these um, equations, they look pretty neat. And you see them on t-shirts all the time, um, usually followed by the phrase, let there be light or something like that. Um, but they're actually not that easy. Um, what is this operator? The delta. What does it stand for? It's the derivative with respect to x. Um, so it's the derivative with respect to y. That's the derivative with respect to z of whatever you put in there, right? So this would be the x component of the uh, electric field, y component, and z component. Right, so this is actually a differential equation. Uh, so the notation is very neat and very nice. The map, not necessarily. Um, what about this del cross? Uh, so first, how is this called? This is the divergence of E, right? This is the divergence of V. Uh, what about this one? How is it called? A curl. A curl. And what does it stand for? This one, it will take me a while to find it. This is uh, the derivative with respect to x. And whatever you have in there, right? Mm -hmm. X or mm -hmm. and so on. You take the cross product. So, is the derivative, you know, with respect to some direction, and that gives you the component in another direction. So this is essentially telling you like how tightly a vector field curls around. Okay, so why am I talking about this? So Maxwell's equations give you the relationship between the electric and magnetic fields and charges and currents. So the divergence of the electric field you know, is uh, constant. So that gives you the shape of the electric field of you know, a charge just goes out. The divergence of a magnetic field is zero. That tells you that uh, magnetic monopoles do not exist. Um, same thing with this one tells you that if the magnetic field changes, or in this case, if the electric field changes with time, it creates an electric field. And if the electric field changes with time, it creates a magnetic field. So this is why light exists. Right? So let's say that how many have taken optics? Say so yes if you have. I have. You have? How many? How many more? Michael and Ramon were in it with me. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And what about um, ENM? Michael and me are in it right now. Okay, so it's ENM one? Yes. Okay. Or it's okay. Okay. Um, 
So let's say that I have over here a um, some polarizing lens, and over here you know, I have a light source. So this light source creates electromagnetic waves, you know, with all sorts of orientation. But what happens when it goes through the, the polarizing lens? Let's say this is a linear polarization. Well, then you're going to get uh, only a single, so the electric field, let's say, is going to move in a plane. What is going to happen to the magnetic field? Well, the magnetic field is created when the electric field changes and vice versa. That might be out of phase. Wait, this is. Mm. Anyways, I think they're out of phase. But this is the idea. So uh, the polarization vector of these electromagnetic wave is going to be, let's say, just E in X, zero and zero. Yep, so it has no component in Y, no component in Z, it's just moving in X. The polarization vectors in general are going to be, you know, E1, one, one, zero, zero, E2, uh, zero one zero e three zero zero one right so they are vectors so Maxwell tells you the relationship between the electric and magnetic fields and the distribution of charges and currents so What if I write this? What is that? Arturo, it's on your t shirt, I think. SPS t shirt. Well, I know it's part of the field equations, but I can't remember which one it refers to. It refers to all of them. So this is just notation, right? So just like you have the uh, del dot and del cross in uh, electromagnetism as a shortcut for, for what you mean. Um, this is a shortcut too. So I think this includes something like 60 equations. Oh, wow. Yeah, so just like Maxwell tells you the relationship between the electric and magnetic field and the distribution of charge and how the charge changes or the current. The, uh, the Einstein field equations tell you the relationship between um, space time and the distribution of mass. So they are analogous to the, the, this, these two sets of equations are analogous to each other. Um, so it's kind of um, you know, a little bit mind blowing. Um, you, know, you can imagine, I imagine a field kind of like a, you know, a cube with lines. So there's lots of lines, you move one of them, 
and lines are transverse and horizontal and, and vertical. And so the wave can just move around. So that is light, right? Moving in an electric field. So it's kind of mind blowing that space time is the same to gravity, to a gravitational wave. So it is just um, oscillating space time. So Maxwell's equations are not easy. Uh, these equations are not easy at all. So the instead of having polarization vectors, uh, there are polarization uh, tensors. So well, I'm gonna write it down later. And so all the quantities in the Maxwell equations were uh, vectorial. Well, the quantities over here are tensorial. And all the derivatives in Maxwell's equations were first order. But here you have first and second order differential equations. You know, other than being much more complicated, um, they, are, they are kind of analogous. So again, one describes you know, what happens when you move a charge. It's going to prevent these electric and, and magnetic fields, which are light waves, photons. Um, when you have mass, when you oscillate it, then you produce gravitational waves. So conceptually, you know, they're not that different. OK, so. So the way a gravitational wave is described is usually like that. So this is the mean field. Um, and this is what you get when you have the perturbation for the wave. So a gravitational wave is a perturbation to the space-time metric. It's called the space-time metric. This h over here is not Planck's constant. So uh, be mindful of that. This is just a uh, tensor. So in certain um, solution to the Einstein field equations, which is a low mass approximation, which is appropriate for, um, let's say that you observe a collision of black holes, but you're really far away, and you know, the gravitational wave travels mostly through just flat space. Uh, there are no other massive objects in there. Then that wave So here you have four columns and four rows because you have x, y, z, and also the time. Um, and each entry of this matrix um, is actually a, it's going to be a matrix. So this is a tensor. Um, so there are two main things that the gravitational wave is going to do. 
So the electric, uh, the electromagnetic wave moves up and down in the E field and it moves uh, horizontal, right? So right and left in the, in the magnetic field plane. Um, so they have a longitudinal mode and they only have one mode that is transverse. Right, and you can describe both of these with a vector. These are not vectors, these are tensors. So, uh, right over here. So H plus is a stretching uh, mode and H uh, cross it's uh, it's like a curling mode right so in a way these are not that different from the modes that you have in electromagnetism um, so you have, um, you know, the electric field just goes out like that and the magnetic field curls around. This is kind of the same, except that it happens in two dimensions. So if you were to look, let's say that you have your collision over here, you know, these all the gravitational waves, and you're over here. So it, it's coming directly at you. You don't see, you know, at, at a 90 degree angle. Then, how would a gravitation, uh, an electromagnetic wave coming right at you look like? Well, you will only see it moving up. See, it will, it will be kind of like moving up and down just like that, right? And then the B field, you will see it like this if it comes directly at a 90 degree angle. Well, um, the gravitational wave is going to have, you know, it had a, a H plus and a minus uh, H plus. So, and then you had the, okay, so but you had nothing in X, and then you had the Y and the Z. So if you had a circle, and you have a gravitational wave coming at you, this Wait, circle, I have a question. Yes. So since you have nothing in X, does that mean the gravitational wave is traveling in the X direction? Yes. Okay. That's correct. Cool. Yeah, I mean, otherwise you will have to move those four uh, tensors somewhere else. So this is for when it's coming in next. So you will see a that it will compress in one direction like this and then it will compress in the other direction, like that. So this is actually what LIGO observes, right? What it's trying to measure. So this is the stretching mode. Um, you will not see the curl for this one because the curl is like, like this. Uh, when they, they get someone grabs your arm, I don't know how to call that. What's it called? Twist. Twist. Yeah, it's, it's pretty horrible, right? <laughs> so if you do it in the opposite directions, um, you will not see it. And it does happen in kind of opposite directions. So in this, if it's coming right at you, you wouldn't see that. 
But if it's not coming right of you, if it's at an angle, then you will observe this stretching and compressing. And you will see that they are moving kind of, kind of like a, a, like a helix. Um, and this happens, you know, so you can describe uh, what happens to the gravitational, sorry, the, uh, the electromagnetic radiation in only one dimension, but you need two dimensions to represent what happens with the gravitational wave. So that's why you need tensors instead of vectors. But, you know, pretty much uh, the same idea. Okay, so again, I'm not going to, I'm just gonna copy this from uh, one bit. So the amplitude of a gravitation wave, um, It's approximately ten G T squared over D C four. So M is the total mass of the system, uh, gravitational constant, this is the linear velocity. This is the speed of light squared. This D is the um, the distance you know, between the observer and the origin of the gravitational wave. So, how does what was what was say that again? What was V again? D the Which, distance. No V. This one? This? The yeah. Velocity. So they're rotating like this? Yeah. So it's the, the linear velocity. Uh -huh. So. Doesn't that change though? What's that? Doesn't that change over time? Mm, no. So this is for the case in which you're really far away. Oh, okay. Right. So the velocity is going to increase as the two bodies get closer and closer together, but it's negligible you know, compared to this distance. So we are going to check a few of the values that he has on page 111. So for the different gravitational waves that have been detected at LIGO that have been assigned to uh, black, um, black hole and neutral star collisions. So if you do that, if you look at D, uh, one of them, one is two of them, 440 megaparsecs. One is 880 megaparsecs. The other one is 340 and 540. So megaparsec is what? Uh, one times 10 to the six. Uh, light years, uh, parsecs. So, and one parsec is 3.1 light years, is that right? Can someone fact check me really quickly? 3.2. Yeah, so you know, these are um, hundreds to thousands of millions of light years away. So D is very large compared to the distance between the stars. So what I wanted to check using this uh, expression for the amplitude of the wave 
question also. Does the amplitude for an electromagnetic wave changes? As it, as it no. travels further away from its uh, source? No. What's that? It doesn't. It doesn't? No, I don't think so. No. Like maybe, I guess the intensity does, but... The intensity the definitely does. increases, right? Um, so this one does decrease with the distance, which is interesting. So what are the units of this expression? Um, this meter squares second square. This is meter fourth second fourth or meter. And so there's five meters here. There's two squares, uh, two seconds, four seconds there. And kilogram, kilogram. So this is unitless. So this is a, a you can consider like a, a delta of the space in which you live. So the limit for uh, LIGO at this point is. Um, it's a little better than this, but let's say that it's one times ten to the twenty-three, twenty-third, twenty-three. I think it's actually eight times ten to the twenty-four, but you know. So for the system that we analyzed before here with the white dwarfs, how close would they have to be for LIGO to detect gravitational waves coming from such a system? Well, uh, H is that, this is going to be over the distance, so let's do dh is mg d squared over c4. This total mass plus two solar masses. Um, the velocity squared. Um, omega squared r squared um, r over 2 cp center of rotation. And then this one we can get it from uh, Kepler's law. So this is mg over r cubed for r squared. Um, I guess. Okay, so uh, let's put it over here. This is C4. This is M, another C 
two n g over four r. Um, where, where that's it. This was solar mass. So we can get rid of the twos. This is solar mass squared G squared over um, R C four T to the four and R we also calculated that separation was the point zero sixteen. times 10 to the nine meters. Okay, so we have everything that we need. This is two times 10 to the 30 kilograms squared, gravitational constants, the separation between the two stars and the speed of light to the fourth. So that ended up being ended up with something two point fifty six times 10 to the 40 meters divided by 1.91 times 10 to the uh, 40 third power so 1.85 times into negative three meters. So in order to get D, we can divide that by the resolution of the instrument. So the distance was one point eighty five times ten to the twenty. meters. So that is actually not that far away. So one light year is 9.46 times 10 to the 15 meters. So this distance is um, about 20,000 years. So, you know, that might look like a pretty, like it's pretty far away. Uh, but actually, I don't think that there's any uh, system, um, the orbiting system, uh, within this radius of, of the sun that has the potential to become a supernova, that would be pretty bad. Um, 
who kind of destroy us. So we're pretty safe. Um, but you know, that system is not that impressive. So the systems that they detect with LIGO, you know, are hundreds of megaparsecs away. So uh, they are way more powerful bodies and events than you know the, the two white dwarfs orbiting each other. Like you know, these black hole collisions are cataclysmic events. Um, actually, um, I read this somewhere. So they release about one solar mass in energy in the form of gravitational waves when they collide. So gravitational waves do not carry a lot of energy, but these things are just you know, humongous. Okay. Um, so, Yeah, so the first uh, detection of a gravitational year, uh, wave with LIGO was in 2015. Uh, it was black holes. Since then, they have also detected uh, neutron star collisions. And I guess the, the most, well, all of these are kind of famous discoveries, but uh, they also saw the Kilo Nova. So, uh, it was a collision of neutron stars. Uh, they created all these gravitational waves that reached the Earth, were detected. And then they um, um, they knew like what portion of the, of the sky the gravitational wave came from. So they pointed you know, like the whole the whole scientific community. Uh, they pointed uh, all the telescopes to that point. So uh, several hours after the gravitational waves, they detected the gamma rays. And several, like half a day later, they detected the light, you know, coming out of the uh, of the kilonova. So they were able to see in real time uh, gold, you know, being being created and other heavy elements. So here you can imagine just looking at this new source of light in the sky, and then the, the absorption peaks will just start to get created as this material is formed and starts to um, absorb all the light. So that was pretty cool. And that's what, you know, that was the, uh, the beginning of, um, what do you call it? Mm, I forgot the word, but essentially you can, um, look at the sky with traditional waves, X-rays, um, regular light, visible light, and um, infrared, multi-messenger, as Charm would call it. Right. So that's what I had for you. Any questions or anything else that you want to say? Oh, question. Uh huh. So do gravitational waves also travel at the speed of light? Yes. Yeah. Interesting, huh? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, you know, they, of course, we're pretty happy detecting gravitational waves, but in principle, uh, you know, they are, they are also discrete. So they are carried by gravitons. We will not, will ne never be able to detect an individual graviton. So uh, photons have spin one. Uh, gravitons, you know, are bosons because they are force carriers, and they have a, they will have a spin of two. Um, do you think a, a, do you think a graviton is something like a Higgs boson, just a collection of particles around in the gravitational field as the Higgs boson is with the Higgs field? 
I don't know. You know, um, so there is no theory of quantum gravity, right? So these are, this is just from what we know, like this, this these are the properties that the force, uh, the carriers of force of gravity should have, but they have not been detected. And, you know, I cannot imagine something that I have no conception of. So, you know, I, I think at this point you have to be happy with just imagine that they are kind of elastic waves, you know, in, a, in this weird four dimensional um, space. But I think like in trying to imagine, imagine things that are beyond what is known is uh, not that useful. I'm not saying that you should not try to know it, but we're not trying to, don't make false uh, uh, models in your head. Anything else? Okay, so I'll see you on Thursday. We're going to start on chapter three in Weinberg, which is about the interstellar medium. Okay, see you later. Bye. See you Thursday. See you. All right, thank you. Bye.